everyone, and welcome to the third video for week nine of our admin law course. This week we're looking at merits review, and as a result, we're taking a close look at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is the Commonwealth Government Agency that handles merits review. We've already learned that the AAT is an executive agency, which means it can make administrative decisions on their merits without offending the separation of powers. We've learned that the AAT only has jurisdiction if there's a specific provision in an enactment which gives it that jurisdiction. We've learned that the AAT has to overcome its expertise deficit. It has to work out whether to conduct a review or a hearing de novo. And we've learned the AAT can take account of policy, but it's not bound by it. Finally, we've learned that the AAT can affirm a decision, amend the decision, set the decision aside and make a new one, or set the decision aside and tell the original decision maker to make the decision all over again. In this final video, we're going to take a bit of a look at the AAT's procedures. What's the merits review process? There's a philosophy underlying the merits review process. The philosophy is that since administrative law is meant to be the process by which ordinary individuals can hold the government to account, the review process must be as simplified and inexpensive as possible, while still allowing justice to be done. There would be no point even having a review process if it was so darn expensive that only the wealthy could challenge decisions. Admin law can't just be for the rich. So how does it work? In virtually all cases, when an administrative decision is made, the system provides for some form of internal review. Most of the time, a decision document will actually tell people that they have the right to request that the decision be reviewed internally. Remember how a few times on the way through this course we've had a look at the Australian Passports Act? You might remember very early in the course, we touched on section 49, which says, in essence, that if a decision is made by a delegate of the minister, then a person may apply to the minister for the minister to review the decision. This is internal review. No need for court, no need for the AAT, it's all just done in-house. In most circumstances, you actually can't proceed to the AAT if there's an internal review mechanism and you haven't used it. If your client comes to you unhappy about a decision and your research shows that there's an internal review mechanism available, think hard about you how you structure your letter requesting the review. This is an opportunity for you to use your advocacy skills. If you just simply request a review, you can almost guarantee the reviewer will agree with the original decision maker. Instead, explain why the decision was wrong and why the decision should be changed. Government departments don't want to go to the time and expense of defending an AAT claim if they can see that their original decision was flawed. Also, remember that the reviewer is not limited to considering only the information considered by the original decision maker. If the original decision maker seems to have missed a key fact, don't miss the chance to provide additional evidence of that fact. More often than you might imagine, departments will change their view if you put the counter-argument persuasively enough. Let's say they don't though. The next step is going to be filing and serving an application. There's a few things to think about here. First up, the mechanics of the application process are quite easy. There are forms, both online forms and downloadable forms, which are intended for use by self-represented litigants. It's much easier, for instance, than trying to prepare a civil statement of claim or something like that. The reason for this is that, in general, before the AAT and its state equivalents, it's actually expected that people will be self-represented litigants. In fact, in many cases, a party needs to apply to the tribunal if they want to be represented by a legal practitioner. Second, in most cases, a review can only be conducted if the application is made within 28 days after the making of the decision that you want to have reviewed. So that normally means within 28 days after the internal review decision is made within the department, because it's actually going to be that internal review decision that you end up challenging. 
Third, bear in mind the AAT can perform both merits review and legal review. The application should set out one by one the legal problems with the decision and the merit problem. If your client is asking the AAT to vary the decision or make a new one, the application should set out precisely what decision you're asking the AAT to make and why that would be the right decision. Finally, the application should include all of the relevant documentary evidence supporting the claim. Now, we already know from week seven that administrative decision makers are not required to follow the rules of evidence. It makes sense that the AAT is therefore also not required to follow the rules of evidence. However, the AAT is required to make a valid administrative decision, so they must take into account all of the relevant evidence and none of the irrelevant evidence. Once the AAT has received your client's application, the department will have an opportunity to respond in writing. Once that has happened, the usual next step is for the AAT to direct the parties to attend a conciliation conference. What happens here is that the AAT member sits down with the applicant and the department to try to resolve the dispute. An AAT conciliation conference is kind of like a mediation, but with some important differences. The key difference is that a mediator inevitably strives to be neutral in the dispute, not expressing opinions and not seeking to guide the parties to an outcome. An AAT conciliator is not necessarily neutral. That doesn't mean they pick a side. Rather, it means that the conciliator will not hesitate to point out what they consider to be the weaknesses in either case. And they'll often gently advise what decision they believe the tribunal will arrive at. Many disputes before the AAT are resolved during the conciliation process. If conciliation is unsuccessful, well, then we end up with a hearing before the tribunal. This is much like a trial before a court, although its processes are somewhat simplified. Very often, parties will be represented by lawyers and often by barristers before the AAT. A lengthy discussion of AAT trial procedure is really beyond this course, but after a hearing before the AAT, there will be a judgment, and most of those judgments are published. This is very useful because while strict star A decisis or strict precedent doesn't apply in the AAT, previous cases will certainly provide you with some level of guidance as to how the AAT is likely to handle your matter. Finally, if the tribunal renders a judgment, it's still possible to appeal that judgment to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court under the ADJR Act. Section 44 of the AAT Act begins, a party to a proceeding before the tribunal may appeal to the Federal Court of Australia on a question of law from any decision of the tribunal in that proceeding. And that of course makes sense because Ultimately, the AAT's decision is still an administrative decision being made by an executive body. So what we call it an appeal to the federal court, really and truly, it's just an initial court challenge to an administrative decision, but an administrative decision made by the tribunal. Carefully note, though, that you can only appeal on a question of law. It's legal review, not merits review, because it's a court and so for all the reasons that we've discussed right the way through this course, you can't get a court to conduct merits review. So this brings us to the end of week nine of our admin law course. This week, we've been looking at merits review, and in particular, we've been looking at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which conducts merits review. We started by talking about some of the challenges that the AAT faces on merits review, its expertise deficit, the question of whether it should conduct a review hearing or a hearing de novo, and the question of how it should deal with policy. We've learned that the AAT has broad powers in this review function. It can firm the decision under review, amend or vary the decision, quash the decision, it can make an entirely new decision, and it can remit the decision back to the original decision maker. We've learned about procedure. We've learned of the limited extent to which lawyers are involved. 
we've learned that internal review is the first step, followed by an application that leads to a conciliation conducted by an AAT member, and then if necessary, there can be an AAT hearing, potentially followed on appeal uh, on a matter of law to the courts. These tribunals really have revolutionised administrative law. For the first time, there's a real system for merits review, and it's been developed in a way that makes it much more accessible to ordinary citizens with a focus on resolving the problem. Next week, we're going to focus on the question of information. How can your client obtain information about the way in which the decision was made? See you next week.